Call committee back to order, and somebody has some information. I can start. Representative Tipping. Uh, so I just want to be clear. Um, the language that we were debating about um, triggering a committee review and a committee vote uh, appears to be unconstitutional. The legislature cannot delegate. Uh, change in statute to the decision of a simple committee vote. Um, it has to be a change of the full legislature. So um, page 8 of Representative Grant's uh, amendment, uh, and after 2024 period, is not uh, able to be used. Representative Grant. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, so let's just, um, if you guys don't mind, um, I know this is a laborious process, but if you go back to the, the um, amendment that I presented, um, the areas of conflict um, seem to be, and, and I, um, starting on page 2H, item 3, applicant employs no fewer than, the number should be 5,000. Page what? Page two, 2 of my amendment, yep, yep. item H3. And I apologize to the members of the public that you don't have copies of this. This is like a moving target, and um, we're all really trying hard to come up with um, what we hope is good tax policy going forward. So us hanging on all of these words and all of these um, numbers is that we're trying to move in a direction where our tax policy states objectives and states a purpose, and that we provide opportunities for legislative review to make sure that the policies are, are meeting the objectives, and that we have adequate measures, that we're being fair to the company, but also being fair to the taxpayers, making sure that we're asking for adequate information, that it be public, but we only ask for information that we really need in order to ascertain the effectiveness of the credit. And so we've been hammering this back and forth about how many years, and I think we're in a good place that will respect the needs of the company, the fluctuations in the workforce that are endemic to this um, business, and the fact that bids have to be made. We're really hoping that everyone around uh, this room can get behind at least our efforts to craft good policy even if in the end they may not vote for the credit, they'll know that we've done our due diligence to make sure that it's good tax policy. So it's kind of like jumping out of a building with a parachute kit and instructions on how to put it together. So <laughs> please, thank you, thank you for your, uh, your patience. Um, so moving ahead to um, page four in my uh, amendment, um, item three, credit. Subsection B, in, in the fourth line, instead of continuing through the 20th year, it would be the 15th year. So the sentence would read, if a certified applicant completes an ap additional qualified investment of at least $100 million prior to January 1, 2025, the certified applicant is allowed a credit against the tax due under this part beginning with the 11th tax year after the investment required in paragraph A was made and continuing through the 15th year after making that investment. Skipping ahead to page 5, under limitations number 4, Item D, the sentence reads, in no case may the credit be claimed for a tax year that begins after December 31st, and I'd like to change that to 2034 instead of 2039. Again, in, in, in correspondence to the 15th year. Under the decelerated credit, because we are eliminating the exception year, um, and I have a question for Julie about that, but I would just let me run through this language and then I'll ask my question if that's okay. 
under the decelerated credit, it would say the credit allowed if a certified applicant has employment in of less than 5,500, the in an exception year would be cut in all of those lines. Just to eliminate that in an exception year because there won't be an exception year. So the credit allowed if employment drops below 5,500, then these provisions would kick in. Last but not least, um, as Representative Tipping said, um, we can't use the language that we were discussing a little while ago, so I would like to go back to the language that's in the original, this yellow and gray uh, amendment that um, Julie and Ms. Papadak went over with us, and it would say, it would, it would say August 15th, 2024, as is there, and then apart from the, um, the, ta the typo about joint standing committee, um, it would read that language as we had it in the gray. The question um, that was asked, just for clarification, Julie, if you can help us with this, or Ms. Papadoc, um, what I understand we're doing by eliminating the exception year <coughs> means that there are, there are no exception years, that if they have employment of 5,000 in, in the year that they apply, they qualify, but if the, pop, if the uh, workforce, as defined, drops under 5,500, then the decelerated credit kicks in without any exceptions, whatever. It's just as soon as you hit that 5,500. I think that's what I'm trying to do here. And what you're doing is essentially saying that all years work the way exception years work. So instead of there only being two years during the 15-year period in, in your case where the credit, where the, where the employment could go below the general threshold, that it would be possible for that to happen in every year. But then, but they would, but there would be no 100% credit. It would, it would, de it would decelerate. So, that's, in other words, that's right. I mean, I, but I just, I just want to make sure yeah. you sort of understand the difference between that and the draft when you have exception years. The draft when you have exception years is that those two exception years are the only ones where you get a percentage of the credit. Otherwise, you have to have the threshold, and if you're over the threshold for employees, you get the credit. If you're under the threshold, you get no credit. under the current version. But with your version, it could be if the, yes, okay, so you'd get a reduction any time your employment was low a certain level rather than getting nothing. If you go below 4,000, then you get no credit at all. That's the, that's the bottom threshold in this, in this draft, in G. Right, yes. Yeah. Representative Tepla. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So. Uh, I need to clarify here that if we did not accept the change in exception years, that if we continued with the concept of an exception year, there would only be two years in which the entity could receive a credit at a reduced level. Otherwise, they must have enough employment to qualify. I think I personally, because for me, this bill is about jobs at BIW that, and there are so many people, many of them in this room, who live in my community and um, depend on those jobs at BIW, I prefer the exception year version. Um, but, you know, I'm open to negotiation around that. Um, and just, just want to put that out there. Representative Grant. Thank you, um, and I, I, I certainly appreciate that. I just, I think some of us felt that the exception year terms were a little muddy, and we weren't sure whether that was two years with a third year possible exception, and, and, and they were, um, in addition to 
defining exception year in, by, in terms of em, em, employees, there was a line about the, uh, at least $6 million was uh, deducted and withheld from certified <laughs> employees. So that just made it really complicated. And so if the purpose of this is really around the numbers of employees and we want there to be a reduced credit if the numbers of em qualified employees drop below a certain point, then all this conversation about um, income taxes deducted and so forth, it was hard to figure out where to put that. Was it going to be six million if it would drop below 5,500? If it would put it down to 5,000? Would it? How would we? How would we define that? So I think basically, that you get if you have five at least 5,000 employees, you can apply. If you drop below 5,500 then you're only going to get a decelerated credit, period. I think that kind of made it easier to understand, at least for me. That's where I was coming from. But if when we do amendment review, if it doesn't look like the language um, is doing what we want it to do, um, that's my intent. Do we still have the 32 hours in for the full yes. time? Okay. Yeah. Any other f discussion? Go ahead. <laughs> Now's the time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I would really like to convince my colleague from Gardner um, that exception years um, are, are a good idea. Um, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not certain um, if I can do that. Uh, if there's some way we can clarify the language, because it does require over the 15-year period for um, the shipyard to maintain employment at higher levels to receive taxpayer money. And for me, that's, um, that's the essence of this, that this is a, a jobs bill. Could I respond? Yeah. Um, if you could explain to me what this original language actually does, I would, I would appreciate that because I honestly can't understand it. And when I talk with Beth Ashcroft about it, she wasn't sure if that would kick in at the third year or if there were two years. So that's why I was so um, excited about the possibility of eliminating it because whenever there's language I don't understand, I've, I'm suspect of it. So if you could explain it to me or somebody could explain it to me, that would be great. Thank you, Representative. Um, Ms. Jones can help us out here. Well, I, <clears throat> I don't know if I can do more than um, read the language, which you are all doing. Um, I, I was focusing on the number of employees and not looking at the language about taxes deducted and withheld by the certified applicant. Um, I'm qualified for that year total at least six million dollars. I'm, I'm not, I will confess I have not focused on that language and I'm not sure how that works. I would imagine it comes from the existing law, which is kind of based on withholding. Um, maybe perhaps someone from, um, from the company would be in a better place to explain how that works. Think, Mr. Chair, could we ask Ms. Papadoc yep. to Pardon. step up and maybe she could help us with this? Yes, we can. Yeah. Representative Tipping. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, would the intent, Representative Tepler, that you're trying to get across be accomplished by just saying the company cannot have more than two years in the decelerated system? Is, is that all you're trying to accomplish? Or? That was my understanding of the original agreement. Yeah, which is the last sentence of uh, the deceleration, the, or, uh, the uh, exception year definition. Thank you.
Hi. Yeah, yes, uh, there are two exception years, and that is language from the old uh, credit, and it creates a floor. So if, uh, if there are fewer than 4,500 employees, uh, the withholding amount from those wages would have to exceed $6 million in order to still get the credit. It just provides a floor that was in the other credit also, the existing credit. So the floor also has to do with the, the level of wages also, doesn't right. it? So if the level of wages goes up, and you're still putting this approximately the same amount out into the community. That's why this is in there. Yeah, it pr well, preserves a higher paying job. I understood it from that. I understood it as a, <coughs> a stabilizer for, for the company that, and the employees in case the, in, in periods when you're going from one uh, contract on one may be ending and you, you're just starting to move into the other one before you ramp up full production again so that's the way I understood it representative grant thank you mr. chair so but this so if, if this was language from the old credit and we're basically developing a new credit going forward if we have the decelerated section starting at 5500 and we're not it's not tied to the um, withholding anymore it's a it's a straight credit against their tax then we might not need that section anyway if this was part of the old language is that correct we already have a floor and a ceiling here as long as we have uh, some sort of floor yeah. um, we're fine with taking that out so the last sentence of that uh, whole D just simply says a certified applicant is allowed two exception years during the, the now 15-year credit period. And scratch the rest of it for no. D. No. I, Representative I, Grant. I would just say that we scrapped the whole thing. Um, and if you're trying to if you're trying to accommodate as you had said before a company that has is going to have some fluctuations what we're trying to get at here is we, we in the decelerated credit is we recognize that there will be decelerations in sometimes in employment and if that's the case then we'll decrease the credit but that still allows them some fluctuation if we if we leave that two-year language in there then they're only going to allo be allowed to have two years where the exception is it, where the deceleration piece will kick in. And I think that defeats the purpose of what we're trying to do in that decelerated credit. I'm just looking at Representative Tepler yeah, to make yeah, sure yeah. she understands what you're saying. So, because she's the one, she was asking the question. <laughs> Can you repeat that again, Representative Grant? Sorry. I'm not sure. Uh, play back that tape, will you, Julie? Um, in the old version of this bill, there were those exception years built in. Mm -hmm. This now is eliminating those exception years as defined there with the employment levels and the payroll levels. And it is now strictly going to the decelerated side. So if you, if you say they're only decelerate, they can only decelerate two years out of the 20 years then there's no reason to have this decelerated credit and the accelerated credit are opportunities to adjust to the fluctuations of the company's investments and their employment levels mm -hmm. relative to contracts. Mm -hmm. If you limit it to two years, then that's old language from the previous credit. And if we're trying to move forward with a new credit, I don't see the reason to tie them to the two years. If we already are guaranteed that 5,500 is where they start and when they fall below that, then they get a reduced credit for any year that they do that. Not just two, not just four, not just any, but any year they fall below in, in this following schedule. So I don't know if I've made that clearer or muddier, but that's my attempt. I accept. 
Further discussion? Are you clear, Julie, we've been going back and forth between uh, Representatives Grant amendment language and what I call the yellow sheet? Are you clear as to what, what parts so. are what and what parts are the other that were? I think I'm clear. Okay, thank you. Is there any other further discussion? Seeing none, is there a Representative Grant? See, I was going to make a motion that we, I think there's a motion on the table, though. I just wanted to clarify. Was there a motion on the table, Julie? It, the, motion, the motion didn't carry, and then it was tabled. And then the next time, it was discussed. No, no motion on the table. Thank you. Then I will move um, that ought to pass as amended with the amendment um, as, that I've just presented, dated 3-6-2018. And um, if there are any questions with the details, we can look at them at, at amendment uh, review. That's my motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by uh, Representative Terry. Got Further discussion on the motion, Repres uh, Senator Shinette. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to say that um, I really do appreciate um, the good bipartisan work um, of the people around this horseshoe in the committee. Um, I think the bill that we're ending up with um, increases accountability and protections for taxpayers, which I think is critically important uh, in addition to recognizing the stated goal. Um, that being said, um, for me, I like to operate on a basis of, of facts and data. I don't think I would be doing my due diligence if I didn't do that as a legislator. Um, and to me, I still have not had answers to my questions that I've asked numerous times of the company relating to basic financial information. Um, and moreover, if, a, if your parent company is making $3 billion in profits, you're not the one who needs a tax break. Um, and I have some very, I have very uncomfortable uh, moving in that direction to provide a taxpayer handout to a company that can afford it. Um, they have not clearly demonstrated a financial need, and part of it is the lack of transparency around their financials. You provide those financials, you provide that transparency, then we can operate on a basis of where the facts are. We have not been able to operate on where the facts are. And so for those reasons, I will be voting against the pending motion. Further discussion on the motion, Representative Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would echo uh, the uh, remarks of the uh, Senator. Um, I think that this is the best bill that we could come up with, um, uh, working very hard uh, if we decide to um, uh, renew this tax incentive. Um, after listening to weeks of uh, testimony and um, asking many questions, I am still not convinced that this $60 million infusion of taxpayer money is necessary or advisable at this time. It is both too little and too much. It's too little because no compelling case has been made that BIW uh, needs it at this time. That's not to say that there won't come a time in the future when a more compelling case can be made, as it was 20 years ago, when there was no question that BIW was in need of modernization that required a great deal of investment. And I think the decision to go forward with a tax incentive in, at that time uh, was well supported. But we've heard nothing of the sort in this <coughs> round. What all we've heard is that we need it in order to remain competitive. Well, that's a pretty slippery idea. Uh, and I believe that BIW is competitive now. And it's competitive because of the quality of its workers. When I worked uh, uh, for Congressman Tom Allen, we were uh, engaged in the fight to save uh, Portsmouth Naval Air, uh, excuse me, Portsmouth um, Submarine Base. And uh, the BRAC Commission wanted to close that uh, shipyard. But the committee became convinced that Portsmouth 
was the gold standard for the work they did on, on submarines. And that's why it's open today. I think BIW is also the gold standard. And that is because of investment, but it's also because of the work ethic of, the, of its workers and the uh, training that uh, they've gone through uh, to, to maintain their skills and keep up with modern technology.